I was thinking the other day about how things have changed, you know, since we were back in the heyday of the back Gadget in Show. The, the OG days. I know to go back to it, but we did have like multiple cameras. Sometimes three or four camera crews. Yeah, big crew. We had sound men, we had producers, runners. So we had sometimes we performed in front of a live audience. Yeah, it was be thousands of people. We racing vehicles with helicopters chasing us. Cameraman hanging out. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, so things have really changed, haven't they? Because, you know, like, look at us now. All the titles. Someone. Hello. <laughs> Hello, you're listening or watching The Gadget Show with me, Susie Perry, and him, Jason Bradbury. And do you know what? Things might have changed, but we love our little studio, don't we, Susie? We do. Our little podcast cottage. Beautiful. Uh, that's right. We're cottaging. And did you know, as this podcast episode gets released, it will be 20 years since the first ever TV uh, episode of The Gadget Show was broadcast on Channel 5. Yeah, that's right. Uh, June the 7th, 2004. 20 years, eh? Amazing. We don't look a day over 50. Cue the tumbleweed. Mm. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> Gerwin Williams, I think I've said that correctly, mm. thinks we look great. He commented on YouTube to say, nobody has changed in 10 years. Awesome chemistry. You see, what Gerwin said could be taken in two ways. Right. Could be that we've got great chemistry together. Yeah. Which is the obvious way. Yeah. Or he could mean chemistry, as in we could be like chemically enhanced. All oh, right. And that's why we still look the same. I'm definitely enhanced, Susie. Can't you tell? I've had the works. Boob job. What? Buttock implants, Botox, back sack and crack. Really? What about a hair transplant? I've always wanted that, but um, yeah, no, I've, uh, I've never plucked up the courage because the way I see it, if Elton John, with all of his hundreds of millions, looks like that after a hair transplant, <laughs> I'm not lining up to have one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sir Elton. So, Susie, what are we talking about this week? Well, you know, a few weeks ago, we asked out for any ideas. And we had quite a lot of people say, podcasting equipment, what yeah, do you use? So we we'll start with our professional setup that we use here. We use road equipment. So if I start with a mic, this yeah. is their pod mic. Um, it's directional, top direction. So if I do this, you can't hear me as well as when I'm speaking into the top of the mic. Um, inside, it's got a pop shield. So that takes any any too many too harsh peas yeah. and, and hissing and stuff like that. And it delivers this really beautifully rounded quality of sound, which is obviously what you want to have if you're listening to a podcast, especially if you're not looking at a podcast. So we've got this XLR cable that we use in our setup, but you can also buy a mic and have a USB setup if you want to do it on your laptop. Yeah, they do the pod mic in USB format, yep. don't they? But if, you, if you've got the money to spend, then you might want to see what uh, Susie and I's pod mics are uh, plugged into. It's the Rodecaster Pro 2, which is this unit here, which is rather sexy. Well, I mean, in terms of the rundown of the specs, where do you start? It's got a, a, a quad, quad core processor or quad processor. Basically, it's a sound card. And so you can plug that thing in via USB if you want into your laptop and then you can configure it using software. Or you can do what we do, which is really cool, which you can use it standalone with an SD card plugged into the back. And we record everything that we say on a tiny SD card. Or you could use one of the two USB-C um, ports on the uh, Rodecaster Pro 2 uh, to whack in an, uh, like a solid state drive and record it all on there. So that gives you a really good reassuring, uh, you know, option for recording all of your content. So you could, if you wanted to, plug it into your laptop, control it on the laptop, record what you're doing on the laptop and record it to SD card. And I'm guessing, you, yeah, no, but then you, you, yeah. And then you could possibly even record it simultaneously as a third recording <laughs> On your solid state drive, I, I don't know for sure that you can do that. All I'm saying to you, you've got lots of options. Options include Bluetooth connectivity. You could do phone calls like they do on the radio um, and connect your phone via Bluetooth and get the, uh, the conversation into the mixer. Talk about the mixer, you've got a range of, uh, of different channels so that mm. you can control um, inputs from multiple guests on up to four microphones locally and some of the other inputs. Uh, and you can get the right level, so you can get because people talk at different levels, different volumes, don't they? And then you've got all those cool buttons, which you can pre-program 
with amazing sound effects uh, like that. You've got loads of outputs uh, via standard uh, line out and line in, and Susie mentioned the XLR. There's also got a lovely full color screen where you can see all your levels jumping up and down so you can make sure that you're not you know, over modulating and stuff. Really, it gives you the kind of functionality you would have dreamed of 10 years ago in a £100,000 studio mm. for, what, 600 quid plus, which is not a small amount of money, but really you can run a top professional system off that unit, the Rodecaster Pro 2. But you don't have to break the bank to, to get into this sort of thing. No, there are loads of other options, and we've got one of them here. So this is an Audio Technica uh, content creator pack, it's called. Um, you get a lot for your money, Sue. It's about £200, I think, isn't it, this? Yeah, you've got a nice boom arm, a nice metal boom arm. Yeah, so uh, can you just hold there. up the, yeah. the boom sure. arm that you can attach your microphone? Oh, you can pass it to me and I can do Thank it. Thank you. So this is the mic arm, and it's... Well, it's very sturdy, steel made, I'm assuming. Um, I mean, it's it's not dissimilar really to what we've got it's not on the table, dissimilar. is it? So it's... It's sprung, it's gonna hold the microphone in position so you can yeah. put it towards your mouth or push it away. Um, and the microphone that it's holding um, is a condenser microphone, a cardioid. I notice it's got an external pop mic. shield on yes, it. Yes, so the internal one that you mentioned with the pod mics, uh, is replaced by an external shield there that should do something to reduce those hisses and those pops. Um, and this one is USB-C. So what that means is that you can plug it directly into your computer um, and avoid the extra expense of getting a complicated mixer. So you're mixing it or, you know, setting your levels in software on your laptop effectively. But that's the, uh, the Audio Technic Technica um, condenser microphone that comes with the, cre the content creator pack. You also get some headphones, Suze. Yep. So not bad, really, for 200 quid if you're an enthusiast and if you're just kind of starting out. Uh, the idea, really, with this kit is that, you know, if you're making gaming videos on YouTube or Twitch or you're starting out in the world of podcasting, you know, there isn't a huge financial barrier to jump over. You can actually mm. get some decent kit um, and get started in the wonderful world of content creation. And to record and edit on your laptop, you can use software like Audacity, which is free, yeah. um, GarageBand, or Adobe Audition. They're options, and they're all very accessible and they're easy to use. They so. are, and they've got a range of filters and things if you want to just you know, improve the audio quality or change your voice or edit bits and pieces, as Susie said. And then just because the question was asked by one of our law listeners and, uh, or viewers, um, we use a platform called Acast.com. Uh, it costs around $25 a month. For distribution. Yeah. So we distribute to multiple platforms, don't we, Susie? Spotify, Apple, Google, et cetera, all at once. And, of course, that platform also offers you the possibility, should you be successful enough and you know, gain a significant audience, to monetize your creation. So there you go. That is the full answer to the question. I hope that we've answered your question and also inspired some of you that might want to get into the art of content creation and podcasting and all the rest of it. Now it's time for this week's guest, Jace. Uh, his name is Chris Stokel Walker. He's a broadcaster and he's written four fascinating books. And he's really into the kind of subjects that me and Jace are into. So we <laughs> yeah. thought he would be a great guest, but he can't be here in the studio. So we're going to dial him up. Chris, great to see you. Thanks for joining us on the Gadget Show podcast. Let's just start by telling us a little bit about your new book, which has just come out, um, How AI Ate the World. Yeah, well, it's essentially an attempt to try and look through kind of seven decades of artificial, artificial intelligence and a decent amount of time uh, before that, because obviously the phrasing artificial intelligence came about in 1956, but the, the sort of concepts have predated that a long way. And then to kind of race through that to explain how we've got to uh, the, the present day of you know, a post-chat GPT world and then exploring, I suppose, what the last 18 months have meant for you and I and everybody else that's listening in terms of you know the impact on our lives, on our work, on our kind of environment and on our society. So um, looking, I suppose, both at the, the positives and also at the negatives and um, you know, there are a decent amount of both in, in the sort of whole thing. Yeah, because it's a contentious issue, really. And Jason's very um, pro about it. I'm slightly sitting on the fence with it, really, because I, I am, do have huge concerns. But having investigated it as much as you obviously have, 
where would you say you sit with it? Probably squarely in the middle of you. Uh, I'd probably be sat right in between you and that microphone right there. Um, but yeah, the I think it's difficult because you look at sort of numbers that are really quite scary. And I suppose I'm more on kind of you know, your point of view, Susie, of 300 million of us uh, will see our jobs affected by generative AI in the next decade. That's a bit of Goldman Sachs, uh, Sachs research. And then likewise, you know, the International Monetary Fund says you know 40% of jobs in some way uh, will be touched by generative AI, both for good and evil. But then if you kind of look at Jason's point of view, you know, generative AI is the great enabler, right? It is it is this thing that can kind of supercharge our skills, make us way more productive. And that same Goldman Sachs report that says, you know, 300 million people will see their jobs kind of changed permanently also says, well, you know, this is going to produce a $7 trillion benefit to gross domestic product worldwide. So, you know, in the book, I kind of speak to some of those who have really had some pretty you know, torrid times with uh, AI replacing their jobs. There's a Argentinian voice actor called Alejandro Graue, who did a load of voiceovers for YouTube videos, you know, one month pre-generative uh, AI taking his job. He did 30 videos a month. The next month, um, after the YouTube channel had found a way of kind of automating his work, it turned out to be absolutely zero videos. But then you know, there are others. There's a guy called Billy Hendry in the book who is um, a New Zealand uh, civil servant who um, struggled constantly to get jobs because he didn't have the skills to put down what he knew on paper in terms of like a job application. But then suddenly with ChatGPT, he's able to do that and actually got the job and is succeeding really well. So yeah, I'm in between, I suppose. I think there what, are good elements about Where are you positioned with regard to how you view those that have the keys to the kingdom? So Sam Altman, for example, uh, Elon Musk, uh, uh, you know, the heads of Google, uh, Apple, um, you know, because they do wield quite uh, extraordinary power. And um, that concerns me. Yeah. And, uh, and look, I mean, you know, it's a Gadget Show podcast, right? I was watching this, you know, many, many years ago when I was kind of a teenager. And so we've grown up as we've been watching the program and as we've been listening now to the podcast with. Uh, kind of, you know, the scales falling from our eyes in terms of social media and the excesses that they've done. So, you know, you mentioned kind of, you know, the NSA issues and, and things like that, the Snowden revelations way back in, in 2011. Um, and those were concerns. I think we've all become way more sceptical. And I think it's right that we've become way more sceptical, both because there is a precedent that big tech companies um, will do things that maybe aren't in our best interests individually. And we can look at the Cambridge Analytica scandal of 2018 as well. But then with AI, it kind of it becomes a step change, I suppose, Jason, in terms of social media was bad enough and kind of the issues of big tech kind of channeling us down certain routes was an issue. But then actually, you know, generative AI is going to be laid into every part of our lives. Like, you know, we're speaking the day after Google announced at its kind of I.O. conference that it was going to be putting generative AI into our search results, which affects what we see. We've got, if you open up Microsoft Word or PowerPoint now, you have generative AI there by default. Meta apps in the U.S. have generative AI search bars and assistance at the top of all of their apps now. So I am really concerned about that. And I think that you know, the the people in charge are kind of the same old, same old Silicon Valley set that we ought to be a little bit worried about because, you know, I'm both tech skeptic, but also kind of a techno optimist. And I know that, you know, from watching the program many, many times, you both share that kind of view. But there is that concern that actually, you know, at its worst, Silicon Valley does overreach a lot. So, yeah, I'm really worried as well. You have to look at both sides. And if you don't, then, you know, who are you really? Because yeah, that's our job. Ultimately, the, the effect as, is so widespread, well, our, isn't it? Our generation, we've got to be accountable. Uh, b because of you know b because of the exponential nature and explosive nature of this. In fact, let me just pose one question: oh. um, Do you feel that as a writer of a book about AI, that this technology is moving so extraordinarily quickly that even as you write, it, it, it almost becomes outdated? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, again, we're talking the week that not only Google announced its I/O and um, you know had the kind of new versions of all of these. AI models that they were doing, but it you know, came the same week that OpenAI announced GPT-4.0, which is their kind of multimodal 
way of looking at chat gpt so rather than just having to type it in through text or even you know if you've your chat gpt plus subscriber like i am you pay you 20 dollars a month and you can talk to it it was really slow and really clunky but now you know we've seen that they're going to be doing stuff um in real time you know, the book does touch a little bit on that but one of the issues that i found i know you know yeah. jason certainly i know you've, you've written books like these things work incredibly slowly and so you know i did update some of this to sort of February 2024 and, and tried to you know, make conclusions that were kind of a little bit timeless because I knew it would be slow. But yeah, writing tech books in, in a, a publishing world, which is incredibly slow, is a big challenge. You could argue that the rapid nature of AI's advance almost challenges the concept yeah, of the book, book doesn't yeah, it? That, that, when you were saying that, I was thinking exactly the same thing. You've written four books um, over the last few years, clearly the influence that social media has on us uh, and and the surrounding world of that it interests you a lot. So, it, can you just you know talk talk us through your kind of findings on social media and the changes in our world since social media has been such a big part of it? Yeah, I mean, I'm 35. I was 35 earlier this month, so like I. Both grew up watching the program, but also kind of grew up with the internet. I had my first kind of computer aged 11 or 12. Got on social media in the very early days of Facebook when it kind of expanded out of the US and um, have kind of, I guess, been the first generation to see and know a time long before social media and the advent of kind of tech, but also to have kind of been tech native like you know it was growing up while I was in a way um I think that that's you know, kind of quite scary and that's also the reason why I did all of the books so I did one on YouTube because frankly I spent too much time on YouTube and needed to kind of professionally justify the amount of time that I did it then I saw tick yeah exactly Jason's the same <laughs> this one. yeah and then TikTok came around the corner and I spent time on that and I thought crikey I need to do that then you know you start to put put these pieces together of like how your life is changing and how tech is changing and how society is changing in light of all of that and then did this one on the history of the internet and then ai becomes this transformative tech so i think yeah to me i i look at kind of headlines of social media is ruining everything and ruining our childhoods and things like that and go well that wasn't my experience. It's not to say that it's not the current generation of children's experience, and I'm not yet a parent. So yeah, I'm sure that if I was, that would change enormously, those conversations. But to me, it's been kind of a net good. Like, I wouldn't be speaking to you from my house in Newcastle while you're in Birmingham recording that if we didn't have kind of huge tech advances and some of the things post-pandemic. You're so right. I want to ask you about your TikTok boom book from 2021, which yeah. I think is what one of the books that you were referring to, Susie. Yeah. Uh, I'm a huge fan of TikTok. And um, I, strangely enough, despite the fact that it has a reputation for sort of crazy dancing and very, very super hyper short form content, which I know your book touches on in part, um, I, when the algorithm actually learns a, a little bit more about you, which in itself is you know, has, 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 we, we should also be questioning the quality of the output from TikTok. For me, I would argue is the most relevant of all the social platforms that I use. So it, it's what it returns. Why? Well, what, it, what I mean is YouTube will throw out videos that it thinks I, sh I should watch. Yeah. And often it gets it wrong. Mm. Um, Instagram throws up stuff that is very rarely outside my, my kind of followership group. Um, so it's not particularly intuitive at all. Um, Twitter is just a crazy battlefield of ideas that can be quite offensive and, and aggressive. Not nonsense. But, but yes, but but I also see its value too, um, and I'm I'm going to cause some controversy here. Possibly, um, I know that Elon Musk is is to some people a divisive figure, but I'm actually enjoying the X experience more than I was perhaps the Twitter experience. But anyway, the point I was trying to make was about TikTok. Mm. It feels, strangely enough, to me, the most authentic in terms of what its algorithm is doing. And yet, certainly in the US, its, its algorithm is causing all kinds of political problems, leading to its banning in the, in, you know, in the Congress. So what's your view on that? What's behind what they're trying to do to TikTok in the US and should they be doing it? Yeah, I think it's um, it's interesting. It's kind of diagnosing the problem, which is that social media knows us all too well. Now, I don't know, Jason, Like, what's on your For You feed when you open up TikTok? Because I imagine it'll be very different to mine and maybe very different to Susie's. So lots of lots of gaming, lots of pratfalls and humorous things, people falling downstairs, um, uh, lots, of, lots of political content. I'm 
Um, strangely enough, in my private life, I'm, I'm really into American politics, which is probably why I asked the question. Um, I find where we are currently uh, on the eve of a, of a new election with Biden and Trump going head to head. Uh, RFK is a particularly interesting figure to me because he's slightly outside the mainstream and I'm, I quite like some of his ideas. Um, so th that would be a, a fair appraisal of, of and, and lots of film, film and kind of pop culture content and analysis is what, it, what, is what it throws up, which, is, which might surprise some people because they think it's all people doing crazy dances and stuff. But that stuff does come up too. Yeah, and I mean, that's the sub-overlap with my For You feed on TikTok as well. Mine is probably majority cooking. I really enjoy doing that. And then also a little bit of kind of politics and a little bit of news. But yeah, I think what is interesting is that it's, um, you know, TikTok was kind of different, as you point out, to YouTube because the algorithm is based on what's called a content graph. So it looks at actually directly what you're interested in rather than what people like you are interested in or best approximate guesses and and actually in TikTok boom I kind of uh, got some very handy helpers uh, to kind of share their data with me to download it off the app and I could actually watch them as they walked through the algorithm all the different videos that they were seeing and kind of how the the metrics of you know how long they lingered on a video or, or whether they commented or shared it or liked it affected the sort of subsequent videos that they saw and I think that is um you know, good in many ways because it means that actually you know we can see content that is more suited to us but I think that does scare um, particularly American politicians because there is that kind of added uh, element of you know TikTok does have origins in China um, you know the the company has done really really well to kind of westernize and to kind of tamp down a lot of that but ultimately you know the parent company is called ByteDance it's based on an app that was originally called Douyin in China and still exists there and has been kind of westernized and changed to um, you know accommodate our norms but that scares people and it, it's it's really interesting because um, you know in many ways, the issues that politicians have with TikTok are the issues that they have with social media more generally. But I think what they're worried about is that it's kind of got entangled in this geopolitical question. Um, and, you know, personally, I spent a long time looking at TikTok and speaking to people within TikTok. I didn't manage to find that kind of bat phone between Xi Jinping and the, the TikTok leadership of how they're all going to indoctrinate us and suddenly you and I start you know, standing up off our, our couches um, and, and start kind of you know, recounting bits from the little red book or something like that. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that there aren't these kind of concerns. It doesn't. And, and also it can, it can move slightly the other way. Just a quick point, Susie, that I, I mean... There was a lot. There's been a lot of talk around the role of, of companies like, say, Cambridge Analytica. And clearly, you know, marketeers wouldn't be in business. Advertising agencies wouldn't be in business. Influencers wouldn't be called influencers if messaging of that sort, en masse, when targeted in the right way, didn't, you know, Work. yield a result. Mm -hmm. So, so, so it is a it is a powerful force. But I I guess my issue is well, but then it. it it's not so much the influence that the U.S. Senate seem to have a problem with. It's, it's where the influence is coming from because they're using it for their own influence in other, you know, in, on other platforms like Facebook and, and Instagram and, and, and so on. And Google, especially it's Google. A, it's about control, isn't it? It's, and it's about owning that control. I mean, it, it, that, surely that's what it comes down to, right? But you didn't see, you didn't find any... Uh, congruence or any uh, you know tangible scientific or objective evidence that the chinese government are either using information that they glean from from the us uh, or or even putting information into the us you know domestic scene no not i mean on on the latter no different than they do in terms of having kind of you know chinese state sponsored media on youtube or Twitter or whatever, in terms of kind of you know, the argument that I always find really interesting is this idea that like this is an indoctrination machine that is kind of hiding in plain sight and it's like a Trojan horse that suddenly everybody's going to spring out of. And yeah, you made the point, Jason, in terms of um, uh, it, it's the the idea of kind of actually um, almost having like a an ability to enter the open market anyway. So if we did ban TikTok, and you know, as, as Susie says, like you know, this is all about influence and all about kind of who controls the power and the messaging. And if the US wants to ban that, well, if they're scared about China kind of coming in and I don't know, trying to kind of reach the public through this app, 
China can still do that. They can go onto the open market, they can go to the data brokers, they can buy advertising through any number of companies that operate on social media. So, like, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not the world's best journalist, but I'm, I'm far from the world's worst. And I'd like to th- consider myself kind of, you know, some sort of a specialist on this stuff in terms of TikTok in particular. And I haven't seen anything. In fact, all the cybersecurity experts that I talked to who kind of poured through the source code who would be able to find that kind of backdoor to China didn't. And and so I think, you know, we're seeing an element of kind of, you know, geopolitics really muddling the water here. Do we have too much social media in the world at the moment? And and is there will it ever pair back, do you think? Yeah, I think in terms of um, kind of alternatives to, to Twitter, to X, I think, yeah, there's way too many. I can't keep track of my Blue Sky account and my Threads account and my, my Twitter slash X account. And you know, I did have a Mastodon account, and I, for my sins, I no longer use it because it's uh, just too complicated to to keep on track of four different conversations. I mean, you, you know, there is a lot of overload and there's a lot of kind of overlap, I suppose. Um, as a journalist, I'm kind of still on Twitter on X. My experience has been kind of different, I suppose, to Jason's in that, you know, I'm with you, Susie, in that I want kind of like a uh, a lighter sort of approach to things. And, and Twitter does seem to have just a lot of shouty people on it, you know, shouting past each other rather than necessarily talking to each other. Um, horribly... I've had to, and I, you know, if if I told myself this maybe five years ago, I'd be saying that I'm an awful person for doing so. I'm having to spend more time on LinkedIn now, um, in part because it's just it's just a, <laughs> a professional networking thing which allows me to find sources, but it, it's just awful. But they're you know, they're kind of also converging into the same stuff. And I think what's interesting, Susie, in terms of like you say, is there too much social media? I think there's too much social media doing the same thing. So. You can post videos on LinkedIn. You can post kind of you know, ephemeral stories on LinkedIn. Um, you know, all of these social media platforms are kind of becoming one in the same because they're all hoping that others will fall by the wayside and they step in. They're vying for the same space and trying to stay relevant. Yeah, precisely. And, and, and ultimately, they're all doing kind of bad copycat versions. I mean, if we talk a little bit more about kind of like yeah, the TikTok analogy, like Instagram Reels was set up to try and be a TikTok killer. And then you have YouTube Shorts that yeah, was, was you know, Alphabet, the parent company of YouTube and Google saying, oh, hang on, like, you know, TikTok is eating our lunch and we don't want Instagram to kind of corner off that market. So we better do a, a not as good version as well. And so suddenly you're kind of bombarded with the same stuff. And I guess that's what I miss a little bit is, um, and it's also a big worry with kind of, you know, the advent of, of generative AI. And one of the things that I get into in that book is like, when I was growing up in the early 2000s on the internet, Everything was kind of like a riot and everything was kind of different. And it was, you know, scary in some ways, but also incredibly exciting in others. And like a bit anarchic. And one of the things that I think is different now is everything is just kind of the same and it's just different kind of vague flavours of the same recipe. Here's a question then. How will AI affect social media? Make it worse. Yeah, those those boring LinkedIn posts that we see are now going to be generated by you know ChatGPT and stuff like that by business people who uh, you know don't want to have to think about it themselves, and so we're just going to end up with walls of text that are really rubbish. Um, and you already see that on on kind of X as well, right? Like you know the number of posts that I put out where you'll get bot replies that are kind of you know very obviously AI generated. Some of which say you know as a as a large language model, you should not trust my output and things like that. They literally have the kind of boilerplate that ChatGPT gives you. So, you know, that's one of the big issues. I don't know if we're allowed to swear on the podcast, but Cory Doctorow has this great theory of end somethingfication. I won't say it's the S word, um, of kind of the internet becoming just piled up with kind of AI generated junk food, essentially. Um, and I think that's what is kind of the concern about this stuff and it's one of the things that I I spoke to a lot of artists in particular for the book about how they're seeing AI as both a big threat because ultimately it can just wholesale copyright uh, copy sorry their 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 copyrighted images but also as a benefit because they can kind of use it as a muse as a sounding board and as a way of maybe you know expanding their their thinking to develop new things that maybe they would never have thought of because they didn't have the time. Yeah, and at the moment, I would say that so the social media experience, the experience of interacting with an AI, um, 
is ring fenced uh, generally around our device, our, our mm. phone, mobile phone. But I guess uh, quite a, a terrifying scenario is getting something like, you know, the, the Vision Pro version 3.0 or Samsung or LG or Sony's version or Meta's version five years hence. So now you can't even escape it. So all of this, this sea of information, what did you call it? The junk food of information. I like that. Um, it is now actually, you know, augmented in the real world in front of you it's on every surf surface so so that is concerning it also sounds very much like a lot of the science fiction that i used to read when i was younger i mean you know things like neuromancer the, these are dystopian novels for a reason <laughs> yeah but what's really interesting about it i think is that actually it, yes we are seeing kind of that dystopian future coming about and i am i think actually probably maybe a little bit more pessimistic than optimistic. I think I'm probably closer to Susan than I am to you, Jason, in terms of you know, the outlook for this stuff. But to me, what is really exciting about this generative AI moment is if you look at kind of the 70 years of the history of artificial intelligence from 1956, when that phrase was coined at a Dartmouth summer conference by a bunch of researchers that had been kind of operating in the same space but had never really come together under one unified banner and then they did and actually having that branding kind of made it amazing because it meant that they got loads of money to be able to play with cool things and develop new ideas um it kind of brought us a little bit closer out of the realm of science fiction into kind of science fact but back then the hardware and you know i was listening to one of your old podcasts recently in terms of like you know talking about the you know the the evolution of like handheld gaming and things like that. I think it was a couple of weeks ago we were talking about it and like how yeah, Moore's yeah, law is improving and all that stuff. Like to me, what's really brilliant about it is artificial intelligence never really lived up to its promise over 70 years because the people were always thinking harder than the hardware was. Um, you know, Alan Turing was writing chess programs literally on paper because the computers didn't exist to be able to actually run them at the time. We've now got to a weird, interesting point where the hardware is like so powerful and so brilliant that actually what was science fiction is science fact. Like I watched the Jetsons on Cartoon Network in reruns when I was like six in the, the early 1990s, which was like a 1950s or 60s children's cartoon, giving me a vision of what the future was. And I haven't got my flying car yet, but I am getting pretty close to actually those really interesting kind of conversational tools and robots. And, and that is exciting. I think we're at that point more than we've ever been, which is also why I think this moment in AI is different to all the other ones where there's been false storms of this happening tomorrow. Fascinating, isn't Brilliant. it? Brilliant. Really good stuff. Yeah. Tell us the name of your latest book again, please, because I, I'd love to uh, give people who listen to the podcast or watch the podcast an opportunity to uh, check it out. Yeah, so it's called How AI Ate the World, and the reason why it's in past tense is because I do think we're already at that point where it has eaten the world. Yeah. What's next for you then, Chris? <laughs> uh, another book, uh, probably on uh, fake news and disinformation, because that is another concern. And then lots of other stories. Do you know, I was on the border when we were deep in that heart of conversation of, yeah. of bringing in disinformation. And I just thought, we can't go down this wormhole because we'll be talking for hours. We will. We will. And, and but, but how timely with the US election coming up yes. uh, and, and, uh, and an election in the UK as well. All elections. Great stuff. Thank you very much for your brain and um, good luck with the future. Nice to talk to you. And it's lovely to know that you grew up watching The Gadget Show as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Cheers. Right, I'll tell you what, that was great. That was enjoyed that. Yeah, but I think lovely. we've done quite a lot of AI, so that's enough AI for this series. What you got? Um, I've got an AI-assisted <laughs> toothbrush, a moral B. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> you... For real! It's called the Genius X. Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a smart ish toothbrush uh, that uses no joke artificial intelligence to analyze your brushing technique and uh, make sure that you're doing well how do, how do you i'm mean? sure you'll be really how, excited to hear how that. does so it we... differ from a normal electric toothbrush well tell you what let me have a go on it yeah and then i'll try and tell you how. okay this is oh going to be God, oh, good obviously that. jason is now cleaning his teeth with this ai toothbrush i'm not going to ask you to talk while you're cleaning oh i'm looking at can you show me that please I can actually see his teeth on the app and what he's doing. You're scrubbing. You shouldn't be scrubbing. You should just be holding. See, it was always me that did all the toothbrush features. Okay, that's enough now. Stop it now. That's enough cleaning. Jace. Can you look away, please? 
I've, I've, I've seen more than that in my lifetime to worry about you with your toothbrush. So just obviously Jason is now emptying the toothpaste out of his mouth. So I was watching you clean your teeth, but not you physically. I was watching the, the phone and what you were doing. Yes. So what data is it harvesting there? What is it telling us? Motion sensors recognise aspects of your brushing style. Uh, and then um, my guess is that they're matching that against a database of mm. other brushers and using artificial intelligence to look for pattern recognition you know to let you know that you're doing it right or yeah not, so that so they'll look at the i'm guessing the health of other users uh, and uh, matched against their brushing styles compare you to that and then give you advice on how you should brush more efficiently um it's got the gum pressure control which other mm. devices in the series uh, also have uh, so it can light up and tell you when you're applying too much pressure i'll say that as the owner of a much less expensive off-the-shelf cheapo electric toothbrush. That was like a beautiful uh, feather pillow on my teeth compared to the assault on my gums that is my <laughs> battery-powered, you know, high street chemist special. I was quite impressed by that, I've got to be honest with you. Um, as you can tell, I, I can't give you a full review because I haven't had the product long enough to do that. And I think yeah, I need to acknowledge that to our listeners and viewers. Mm -hmm. But I, um, I like that. It's got a unique rounded head that is um, designed to remove plaque efficiently um, and six different cleaning modes, which I wasn't able to go through. Um, but it's got modes like, you know, modes for sensitive teeth, for whitening, whitening things yeah. like that. I had it on the standard setup. And I have to say, I do, f I feel quite minty fresh at this point. I'm rather cynical. I don't know about you, about the moniker of AI, AI. yet again. I, th I feel like quite a lot of companies are adding an AI element, but also boosting the price of things to you. It does feel like that. But then, you know, Oral B are an established brand, aren't they? Well, they're a fantastic brand. I mean, you know, it's quality. You know, you're going to get quality toothbrush. I didn't, I mean, I really mean this. I did instantly. I was, I was actually quite cynical. I thought we'd have a laugh with this. That felt, you liked it, didn't it you? felt good. It you felt it. good. And, you know, you only get one set of pearly whites, don't you? Um, and if you're lucky. Yes. As long as the, you know, as long as it's not too ridiculously expensive, then um, I, I'd consider moving across to something like that just based on how comfortable it felt. Um, and the very fact, as you pointed out, that it was in real time, sh it knew where I was in my mouth. So therefore, surely matching that against other, other cleaning habits and hopefully the, the right cleaning habit, the most effective way of doing it, it should be able to give me a better teeth cleaning routine. I guess the aim really is when, you, if you're looking at the phone, while you're cleaning your teeth, you can see where you're the bits that you're not getting to, yeah. which you're not aware of, I suppose, if you're not, if you don't have that data. Yeah. So in, in one respect, it's quite good. And it's actually just under a hundred pounds. So no, it is. You are joking. Well, I can get that for less than a hundred quid. Which is, I think for an electric toothbrush of that quality is actually quite good. I'm amazed. I really am amazed. I know that some companies, I'm not saying which ones mm. charge a bit too much for, this part when it needs to be replaced. Um, that's the toothbrush. That's the toothbrush head that I'm holding up. I'm not naming any companies, but I do feel that um, sometimes they take the right mick when it comes to the, the price of replacement heads. But I have to say that buying a toothbrush of that quality with that sort of functionality, even at the basic level, the gun pressure control and the fact that it, that it had a timer on my phone via Bluetooth that showed me that actually because we were doing this on the podcast, mm. and, podcast and I gave up early, I actually didn't clean my teeth for long enough. For under 100 quid, with all the other fun bits of different cleaning modes and, and AI, I think that's amazing value for money. And also on the big high street chemist shop that we all know and love, they often do half price for electric toothbrushes. That's my wow. tip to wait until they do the sale and then go and get yourself one. I started off very cynical. See, look at you now. I'm now a fan. A pearly white fan. So, Susie Perry. Oh, I'm going to... I feel minty fresh right now. I feel like I want to snog the mic. I feel, like, I feel really freshened up. That's not weird at Internally all. Internally massaged. It's going to be a week before we get to do this again. Oh, I know. But it's some sort of kind of strange um, time-lapse switcheroo. Yeah. Um, you know, you at home can yeah. just listen to the next episode. Oh, right. Like... You mean if you are a Patreon yeah. subscriber, uh, then uh, you can get access to the podcast a week earlier 
than everyone else. So obviously we encourage you to do so. We, we are hugely appreciative of all of your support. A number of different tiers. So you can do things like uh, um, check out some bloopers. Not that we ever make mistakes. No, uh, deleted scenes, that sort of thing. At the top tier, you can even come into the studio and, and, and hang out. Oh, I might just um, subscribe to find out what we're talking about next week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a secret. Oh. Okay, it's a secret. But I can guarantee you this. More great gadge coming at you in next week's edition of the Gadget Show podcast. I've not heard that for ages. The hey, word gadge. It's probably not strictly allowed. I think but there we go. I said banned. it. See but you next time. Goodbye, Gadget Lovers. The Gadget Show podcast with Jason and Susie was presented by Jason Bradbury and Susie Perry off the telly. It was produced by Ewan Keel and Tom Clint and is a North One production.